Sitting in jail gives you a lot of time to reflect on your own stupidity. However, I wasn't reflecting on anything except hatred. I was focused on the hatred I had for my boss, my soon-to-be ex-wife Carol, and the hatred for myself for being so stupid. Dot, dot. My name is Michael Arnold. And when I say I was stupid, I mean stupid with a capital S. I was stupid as in the clueless husband who didn't know that his wife was cheating on him, and she was cheating on him with the man I hated most in my life, my boss, Jacob Sanders. I was also stupid because I didn't know that the cheating bitch was pregnant with his child. Stupid me thought the baby was mine. I guess my wife being pregnant is what precipitated the honey we need to talk speech. I suppose I should back up a bit and do a little explaining. Strange as it may seem, my current problems actually started in the first grade. I first came to know and eventually hate Jacob Sanders when we both entered the first grade together. We have been enemies since he made fun of my freckles, that was the first of many fights. That one ended in a draw as a teacher dragged us apart. I had a bloody nose, and he had a black eye. Over the first eight years of school, Jacob and I averaged about three fights a year, with the third grade being the worst, we had seven fights. However, in the eighth grade, we only had one for a good reason, I kicked the shit out of him. I didn't want anything to do with Jacob, and I tried to stay away from him, but he wouldn't leave me alone. For some reason, he was jealous of me and was constantly trying to outdo me. He tried to get better grades than me in each of our classes. He was better at science and literature. I was better at math and history. The rest of the subjects, we were about the same. In sports, Jacob was a pretty good athlete. I was a little better. Nevertheless, if I went out for a sport, Jacob went out for the same one and tried to outdo me. Dot dot. The fight stopped, as I mentioned, after 8th grade when Jacob realized that he couldn't beat me. Then he started trying to embarrass me or get me in trouble. He almost got me expelled and arrested while we were in high school. It was in our sophomore year when someone broke into the school and graffitied the hallways. The authorities found my student ID next to an empty spray can in the dumpster. The only thing that saved me was the fact that I'd noticed my ID was missing out of my wallet the day before and reported it. I knew it had to be Jacob because I had seen him walking away from my locker after practice one day, and I came out of the shower. I figured he was up to no good, so I checked everything in the locker. When I got to my wallet, I checked my cash first and then went through the rest of it. That's when I noticed my ID was gone. I went immediately to the front office and reported it. One time, Jacob had a fart nosemaker, he had put the device in the desk I was sitting at and triggered it. The fart sound blasted through the class, and then Jacob began holding his nose and waving his hand. Mike, what did you have for lunch? He chortled. The class laughed, but I used the old standby, he who smelt it dealt it. The class exploded with renewed laughter, which brought a warning from Miss Wormwood that if Jacob and I continued to disrupt the class, we'd be spending time in detention. Being laughed at and then chastised by our teacher infuriated Jacob, he turned bright red that said nothing. Besides attempting to get me expelled than perhaps even arrested, Jacob's efforts were more annoying than anything. For the majority of things, I didn't care if he was better than me. Outside of the normal teenage insecurities, I was pretty comfortable with who I was. However, there was one area that I did care about, and that was girls. Both of us were reasonably good-looking. However, Jacob's family was wealthy, which gave him the edge with the girls in school. He had his own car in the 11th grade, and it wasn't an old clunker. His parents bought him a BMW Z4, which was a $50,000 car. How could I compete with that? As it turned out, I was good-looking enough to get my fair share of dates. On the other hand, Jacob was dating the cheerleaders and the girls in the in crowd. I figured they were out of my league anyway, so I didn't care. However, he wasn't satisfied with his rarefied success with the girls. He had to try to rub my nose in his success. If I dated a girl more than once, Jacob would swoop in and start dating that girl. And it didn't take long for her to drop me. Even there, for the most part, I didn't care. I wasn't going steady with any of the girls. So if they wanted to date Jacob, it was no skin off my nose. Yet, there was one girl that I really did like. Her name was Sandy Springer, and she was smart, funny, and pretty. So, when I started dating her, I took her to out-of-the-way places so that Jacob wouldn't know that I was interested. After a couple of months of dating, 
we decided to go steady. I thought if Sandy was wearing my class ring, I was safe. Remember when I mentioned and that I was stupid? I was stupid all the way back then too. With the senior prom coming up, I just assumed that Sandy and I would be going together. I should have asked her right away, but I'm not sure that would have done any go. Anyway, after I purchased the tickets, I mentioned it to Sandy at lunch. She got right and said that she had accepted an invitation from Jacob to go with him. I demanded and got my ring back, then I left Sandy sobbing in the cafeteria. I never spoke to her again. I was so pissed at Sandy that I was looking to rip someone's head off. Instead, I saw Pam Taylor, the captain of the cheerleader squad, and Jacob's supposed girlfriend. Under normal circumstances, I would never have dared approach her. Hey, Pam, I said cheerfully. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you, Michael? She responded. Tam was gorgeous, but she wasn't stuck up. I'm doing okay, I said, figuring that I had nothing to lose. Say, would you like to go to the prom with me? That's very sweet of you to ask, she said kindly, but I'm going with Jacob. Oh, I feigned ignorance. I must have misunderstood because I just heard that Jacob asked Sandy Springer. I must have got it wrong. Yeah. Forget I said I said anything. I'm sure I heard it wrong. I left Pam flustered and talking to herself. I heard later that she and Jacob had a huge blow up. Maybe he had stolen Sandy from me, but I had messed up his romance with Pam. It wasn't totally satisfying, but it was better than nothing. But later that afternoon, it got a whole lot better. Michael, Pam called to me as I was leaving school. Hey, Pam, I continued playing innocent. I'm sorry about upsetting you earlier. Cut the crap, Michael. Pam's eyes narrowed. I found out that you were going steady with Sandy. And that creep, Jacob, stole your girlfriend. My ears burned red. I had been busted. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was just trying to get back at Jacob. I'm sorry you got caught in the crossfire. Were you serious about taking me to the prom? Do bears. I started to say, never mind. Yes. I would be thrilled if I could escort you to the prom. Good. Because I want payback, Pam said. And if you play your cards right, it could be a very memorable night. The prom turned out to be a true highlight for me. Not only did I get to take the best looking girl in school to the prom, but she made me feel like a prince. Pam was all over me. I reveled in the looks on the other guys' faces. They couldn't believe that she was there with me. And Jacob, I don't know what he thought was going to happen but it definitely wasn't having his girlfriend out on a date with me. I think Jacob thought Pam might go to the prom as one of the football players' date, but certainly not me. His eyes almost popped out of his head when he saw us come into the gym. Throughout the night, he tried to insert himself between Pam and me. He tried to get her to leave me and sit at his table. Pam shut him down. He asked her to dance numerous times, but Pam wouldn't give him the time of day. I really felt sorry for Sandy because she realized that Jacob had used her. Sandy finally broke down crying and had her parents pick her up. I still feel a little bad about that even now, but she made her choice and had to live with it. After the prom, Jacob still tried to get Pam away from me. I was smart enough to know that I was playing the part of Cinderella, and by tomorrow, Pam would probably be back with Jacob, but for tonight, I was going to play my part as far as it would go. And it led to a local motel, where I had sex with the best-looking girl in school. When I dropped Pam off, she kissed me deeply and told me what a great guy I was. I went home floating on a cloud. But as I expected, by the following Monday, Pam and Jacob were a couple again. Still, I would smirk at Jacob whenever we passed in the hall. Graduation came, and most of us scattered to our college of choice. I was sorry to be leaving my hometown and scared about the unknown but I wasn't sorry to be parting ways with Jacob forever, or at least I thought so. I had been accepted at Georgia Tech while Jacob was going to Harvard. Of course, he was going to Harvard, his grandfather had a building named after him there. I did well at Georgia Tech, majoring in software design. And it was at a mixer during my junior year at Tech that I met Carol. I'm not going to bore you with the details of how we courted, fell in love, and got married. Well, in truth, I think at the beginning we were more really good friends than truly in love. Needless to say, our story wasn't that memorable, and it's all irrelevant now anyway. I will say this about Carol, she was smart. 
She was a business major at the University of Georgia. I liked her because she was not only smart, she was also funny and very friendly. However, Carol wasn't super hot looking. She was pretty in the girl next door kind of look. In truth, Carol couldn't hold a candle to Pam, but she was about as pretty as Sandy. For whatever reason, we clicked. We got married three months after we graduated, and for our five years of marriage, I thought we were pretty happy. Even though we were more friends than lovers, and we got married, by the third year of our union, I was totally in love with Carol, and I believe she was equally in love with me. We were even talking about starting a family. Little did I know that my wife had kind of jumped the gun on that and started one without me. Right out of school, I got a job with Zaba Security Software, a small startup company. I had graduated at the top of my class, so I had my choice of jobs. The two brothers at Zaba sold me a bill of goods about being on the ground floor and making a fortune. However, don't get me wrong, the company did very well. The firm prospered, and we turned out quality work for some very large companies. I was also paid a tidy six-figure salary. Our job was to find holes in the company's software security and plug them. Our reputation was growing, but then the brothers decided to cash out. Surprisingly to me, we were acquired by a firm roughly the same size as Zaba, and that's when my problems began. About three years after I started working for Zaba, Carol wanted to find a new job. As it happened, Zaba was looking for an office manager, so Carol applied and was hired. I was a little worried about both of us working for the same company, but it turned out fine at first. We used to carpool and have lunch together. We were in completely different departments and areas, so we rarely saw each other during the day. We drove to work together, gave each other a kiss, and went to our departments. If we were both free, which was most days, we ate lunch together and then carpooled home at the end of the day. It worked well for us until it all went to shit dot dot. Before I tell you about the acquisition, let me tell you about my department. I was the senior programmer, which meant that I worked on projects myself and oversaw the work schedule for the other eight programmers that reported to me. But my main responsibility was to troubleshoot any problems that my team couldn't handle by themselves. Fortunately, those were few, which meant our customers were very satisfied. Our workspace was about the size of half a basketball court. We called it the bullpen, and we worked mostly as stand-up desks. The room was filled with all kinds of computers, servers, interfaces, and printers. We had just about all the computer hardware you could ever want. We took pride in making our customer systems as safe as possible. In the five years I've worked for the company, we've only had one complaint where a customer system was hacked. But we traced the hack back to one of the company's employees. He had disabled much of the software we had installed. The employee wasn't very clever, but he did cause us a sleepless night. In addition to the nine of us, we had an administrative assistant, Kimberly. She was like our girl Friday. She prepared any correspondence or memos we needed. She kept track of our supplies and made sure we never ran out of anything. Kimberly also prepared our monthly reports and kept track of our billing hours. Strange as it may seem, much of our work was done, initially, with pencil and paper. This gave the programmer an overview before he started entering anything into the computer. Somehow, Kimberly was able to decipher everyone's handwriting and typed up the notes for our files. Even though it wasn't part of her job description, Kimberly made the best damn coffee for us every morning. Kimberly was about 23 or 4, I would guess. She had short blonde hair deep hazel eyes, a very pretty face, but she was about 50 pounds overweight. When you consider that Kimberly was only 5 foot 5, that was a lot of weight for her to carry. Even though she had a beautiful face, her large stomach and rear end immediately destroyed the image. I knew that Kimberly was sensitive about her weight because she always talked about how fat she was. I cringe every time she did that, but I understood it was just her defense mechanism. All I cared about was that Kimberly was damn good at her job and an asset to my team. The fact that Zaba had been acquired came out of the blue. The two Zaba brothers didn't even have the courage to tell the employees in person. They had their lawyer make the announcement. I was pissed because all the stock options that the brothers had promised when they went public went up in smoke with the announcement. Aside from that, I didn't know what to make of the change. Carol was as upset and confused by the news as I was. 
but she was the one who convinced me to stay the course until we saw what the new owners would do. They sent a senior vice president in to supervise the transition. He concentrated in the main office at the beginning. Zaba had grown from five employees when I joined the firm to over 150. From what I heard, the man from the new corporate headquarters would start in the accounting department. Then he was going to work his way through the entire company. It wasn't the second day that I learned that the VP reviewing Zaba security software was none other than Jacob Sanders. Oliver, at the same time, I learned that Jacob was heading up the transition. I also learned that to bring our pay scales in line with the parent company, my pay would be raised by $35,000 and Carol's was going up $15,000. My internal alarm told me to run, not walk to the nearest exit. However, Carol convinced me we'd be foolish to walk away from our present jobs, especially after the pay increases. Besides, she pointed out, Jacob would only be there six months at the most, and then he'd be gone. The first change came when for new programmers were hired and assigned to the bullpen. Of course, they were all Harvard men, but none of them was a tenth as good as anyone on my existing team. Not only were they subpar programmers, but they were arrogant and had a sense of entitlement. The four of them immediately started harassing Kimberly. Sometimes it was sexual harassment, and sometimes it was just plain meanness. I tried to counsel them and point out that their behavior was unacceptable. However, they didn't stop. Instead, they just harassed Kimberly when they thought I wasn't around. I finally called all for into a conference room and read them the riot act. They paid lip service to me, but I could tell they weren't going to stop. Aside from their harassment of Kimberly, all four of them were a pain in the ass. Nobody on my team liked them, and they did more harm than good when it came to their work. I finally decided I wanted them gone. Unfortunately, I didn't have the authority to fire them because Jacob had hired them. I knew if I demanded that he dismiss them, Jacob would just ignore me. I knew that Kimberly got in early each day to make the coffee and get the office ready. Ever since I chewed the four jerks out for their treatment of Kimberly, I noticed they all started coming in early. I finally figure out that they were using the time before I arrived to torment the poor girl. I knew that Kimberly was getting to the point where she was going to quit. I also knew that she liked working at Zaba and needed the job. So, I decided to get in early and catch them at it. Ever since I chewed the four jerks out for their treatment of Kimberly, I noticed they all started coming in early. I finally figure out that they were using the time before I arrived to torment the poor girl. I knew that Kimberly was getting to the point where she was going to quit. I also knew that she liked working at Zaba and needed the job. So, I decided to get in early and catch them at it. Hiding in the supply cabinet just off our little kitchen, I had my cell phone ready. As I expected, Kimberly arrived and began preparing the coffee. Minutes later, the four of them arrived, and the tormenting began. Hey, Butterball, Ted, the ringleader, smirked at Kimberly, show us something. Yeah. The other two said, we'll even help take your clothes off. I saw the tears rolling down Kimberly's face, and I couldn't take any more. I had more than enough evidence, so I stepped out of the closet. You four, gather your stuff and leave, you guys are done. You don't have the authority to fire us, Fred shot back. Mr. Sanders hired us, and he said that only he can fire us. That's true, I said with a nasty smile on my face. However, I've got proof that you sexually assaulted Kimberly, so... Let me explain what your options are. You four can either resign immediately, or I will turn this video over to the police. So, the choice is yours. You either resign, or I call the cops. I'll give you 15 minutes to decide. You can even run to Jacob if you want, but I'm sure that he isn't going to put his ass in a sling to protect you scum. 15 minutes later, I had all for resignations, and the four were gone. The look on Kimberly's face was one of utter relief and gratitude. Kimberly, I called her over to my desk after the four were gone. I apologize for what those four put you through, I should have acted sooner. If anything like this ever happens again, promise me that you'll come to me immediately. You're a beautiful person, and those four are just assholes. Kimberly let out a small sob and thanked me for protecting her. I told her that was part of my job, but I didn't do a very good job because she had to suffer at the hands of those assholes for far too long. Mr. Arnold, you don't know how much this means to me, she said, as she fought back more tears. 
I was going to quit, but I didn't know what I was going to do without this job. I didn't know if I could get another job as GOAT. Again, Kimberly, I am so sorry that you had to put up with that garbage. I can see that you're upset. If you'd like to take the rest of the day off, I'll see to it that it isn't charged against your personal days or your sick time. Thank you, Mr. Arnold, but I'd rather be here at work. After that day, it seemed that Kimberly couldn't do enough for me. I tried to tell her that I was just doing my job. And I continued to make the point that I hadn't done my job very well because of what she had suffered. Of course, I got summoned to Jacob's office as soon as he learned that I had forced his programmers to resign. I want those programmers rehire, he demanded as soon as I stepped into his office. That's not going to happen, I said forcefully. I have proof that those for assholes sexually assaulted and abused our department's administrative assistant. If you want to hire them back, go ahead, but I can guarantee that there will be a lawsuit against all four of them, the parent company, and you. I don't think your bosses would think too highly of that. Jacob glared at me, but then smiled and caved. He tried to pretend that he didn't know all the details. But I realized that night that he was lying. Carol came home and laced into me for being an asshole to Jacob. She thought I was a jerk for threatening our boss. I should have known at that point what Jacob was up to as my gut was screaming, danger. But when things at home went back to normal, I dismissed the incident. After all, I still believed that Carol loved me and only me. If I had listened to my gut, I might not be sitting in jail right now. But I was stupid, and I let Jacob band my wife lull me into a false sense of well-being. And for the two months of the merger, nothing really changed between Carol and me. I learned that the company that had acquired us was called Unity Software. They were about the same size as us, but had mostly government contracts. Zaba gave them an entree into the commercial market, and no, Jacob's dad didn't own the company. His family's fortune was made manufacturing pipe and wiring. However, Jacob's father had sold out the business when Jacob was still in college. I could say many nasty things about Jacob, but I couldn't say he was incompetent. He actually was doing an excellent job combining the two companies. In fact, he had convinced the board to keep the Zaba name because it had a better reputation. What I didn't know was that Jacob had finished his work of combining the two companies in eight weeks. After that, he had put the seduction of my gullible wife in high gear. Just like Sandy in high school, Jacob was able to win over Carol. Despite my warnings about him, Carol seemed enchanted by the asshole and constantly commented on what a great job he was doing. I kept warning her about Jacob but she just told me I was jealous. By the fourth month of the transition, Carol announced she was pregnant. I was over the moon with happiness, however, our sex life had been faltering. It had gone from three times a week to once every other week, I put that down to Carol being pregnant. Then our lunches together stopped, and finally, Carol stopped riding to work with me. All this culminated with the talk, Carol stopped me one morning before I left for work. I was a little surprised to find her still at home, as she had lately been leaving at least an hour before me. Michael, we need to talk, she said, while motioning for me to take a seat on the couch. I sat down as requested, confused as to what was so important that we had to have a discussion this early in the morning. However, what Carol told me blew up my entire world. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, Carol said with a hardness in her eyes, but I've fallen in love with Jacob and he has fallen in love with me. I just stared at her for a long time, I studied her face, and what I realized was that she wasn't sorry about anything. Finally, I exploded, are you out of your mind? I told you that Jacob is an asshole, and he would try to drive a wedge between us. I can't believe you're buying into his total bullshit, he's not an asshole, Carol flared, he's a kind and loving man. He understands me, which is something that you never have. I could feel my soul being crushed with each word that Carol said. I was desperate at this point, so I went with something that I hoped would bring her to her senses. What about our unborn child? I said softly. Doesn't that mean anything to you? The child isn't yours, Carol said with a tight smile. I was stunned by her statement. That's a lie. No, it isn't, she said. We hadn't had sex for two weeks when I got pregnant. Now I was beyond furious. You cheating 304. You've been screwing that piece of shit. It's my body, and I can do what I want with it. She screamed at me, 
You don't own me. Devastated doesn't even begin to describe how I felt. But my father had once counseled me to never show woman that she had wounded you. Keeping my composure was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But I was able to hold it together and smirk at her. You said that Jacob understands you like I never have. I said with a tight laugh, you're right, he does. He understands that you're a stupid, gullible 304. God, you are so stupid. But you know what? You deserve each other. He's a scum sucker, and you're a cheating 304. Screw you, Michael, Carol stormed. No, that's never going to happen again, I said calmly. But just so you know, I'm not moving out of this house. You can go live with Jacob in his apartment. We'll see about that, Carol turned and headed for the bedroom. What a nightmare I had fallen into. Learning that my loving wife had been screwing Jacob all this time was too much to process. I wanted to beat the shit out of the scum sucker, but I just didn't have it in me to hit a woman. Jacob, on the other hand, I had no reservations about. I cried all the way to work but finally got myself under some sort of control. Well, that's an out and out lie. I was running of pure rage. On the way over, I had decided that I would resign and beat the shit out of Jacob, but not necessarily in that order. I ran into Jacob as he was entering the company's front door. He didn't seem at all alarmed to see me and even flashed a smirk at me. A thought sprung up in my mind that it would be so like Carol to take it upon herself to drop her little bomb on me without consulting Jacob, she was very independent. Jacob, on the other hand, I suspected, had no intention of telling me about the baby until after it was born. Then he would take both my wife and newly born child away at the same time, it would be his ultimate win over me. Rage filled me, as I walked up to him, he just continued smirking. At that moment, I exploded and punched him in the nose and then in his mouth. Blood immediately began to pour down his face, but I wasn't through. I hit him to hard shots to his balls, and as he began to crumble, I hit him with an uppercut. I left him curled up in front of the door as the guards raced to help. Later, I would learn, he lost three teeth in addition to a broken nose, he also had a ruptured testicle. I didn't come out completely unscathed as I had broken two fingers on my left hand. I headed to the bullpen and started boxing up all my personal possessions and papers. Kimberly saw me, and I could see concern and fear on her face. What's happened? She asked with genuine concern. Jacob has been screwing my wife behind my back, and now she is leaving me for him. I just beat the shit out of him, so I guess I'm terminated, and even if they don't fire me, I quit. The rest of my staff was shocked to hear what had transpired. My team was not only upset for me, but was also very worried about their own individual jobs. I assured them that what I did would have no effect on their continued employment. Once the staff was calm and assured that they wouldn't suffer for my stupidity, I went back to packing up my stuff. But I never finished as the police arrived and I was arrested. I expected that that would be my fate, but I didn't expect it to happen so soon. As they handcuffed me, I asked Kimberly if she would gather up the rest of my stuff and take it home with her. After I had my mugshot taken, was fingerprinted, and given paper towels to clean my fingers, I was allowed to make my phone call. But I didn't know who to call. My parents were away on a cruise. They also lived 2,000 miles away in San Diego while I lived in Nashville. I certainly wasn't going to call Carol. Finally, I decided to call Kimberly. Maybe she could find me a lawyer. However, when I called Zabo, the receptionist told me that Kimberly had left for the day. After that, I didn't know what to do, so I just sat in my cell, alternating between being angry as hell and wondering how I could win my wife back. One thought kept raging in my head. How could Carol betray me in such a cold and heartless way? Then the thought of getting revenge clouded out everything else. As the day wore on and I languished in jail, I began to realize that Jacob already had a plan in place. My troubles were just beginning, I know that Jacob wasn't expecting the beating that he got today. However, I was convinced that Jacob expected me to attack him once I discovered his treachery. Only he figured that he could do it at his own time and place of choosing, I guess I ruined that part of his plan. About for that afternoon. I was brought before a judge to be arraigned. I had been assigned a public defender since I didn't have an attorney. To my horror, he looked like a teenager with a bad complexion. Not only did my attorney look like a kid,
but he didn't seem to know anything about me or my case. He was quickly trying to read through the file, and the judge got annoyed with him. Counselor. The judge barked, it's really simple. Does your client plead guilty or not guilty? The kid glanced over at me like a deer staring into the headlights. So, I jumped in and announced firmly, not guilty, thank God. The judge sighed. Dale is set at $2,500, cash or check. I didn't have nearly enough cash on me, and I didn't carry blank checks with me, so I looked up at the judge. Excuse me, your honor, but I don't have that much cash, and I don't carry blank checks with me. Is there some way I could contact a bail bondsman? My clerk will help you with that, and she lets you know when your court date will be, he said. But before he could call the next case, I heard a voice from behind me, I'll post his bail. I spun around and found Kimberly waving her checkbook. I was stunned to see her in the courtroom and very touched that she cared enough to come and help me dot dot. I'll repay you as soon as I can get to an ATM, I assured Kimberly. I'm not worried about that, she said softly as she looked at my swollen hand. Does it hurt a lot? In the overall scheme of things, it doesn't even register compared to the pain of Carol's betrayal. For what it's worth, boss. Kimberly said, looking up into my eyes, I think your wife is a very stupid bitch. She's made a huge mistake, trading you for Jacob. I smiled at my administrative assistant. Thanks, that's very kind of you to say. At that point, a young man stepped in front of me, are you Michael Arnold? When I said, yeah, he handed me an envelope and said, you've been served. I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised but the speed at which the papers had been served upon me left no doubt that Jacob Van Carroll had been planning this for some time. It was just another cut into my heart dot dot, let's get something to eat, after I get some cash out of the ATM, I said despondently. However, when I tried to access my account, I was denied. I called the bank and was told there was a freeze on all of my accounts. This would remain in effect until the court lifted it. Yes. I know now that you can petition the court for relief from having your assets totally frozen, but I didn't know it back then. I also found out that my other savings account had been frozen, and my credit cards had been cancelled. A quick check of my wallet showed that I had $126, plus a $100 bill tucked in one of the creases. Apparently, Carol and Jacob have frozen all of my money, I informed Kimberly. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but at least I can buy you dinner. No. You're not, Kimberly protested. You're coming to my apartment, and I'll cook dinner for us. I had to admit that Kimberly's suggestion appealed to me. It didn't make sense for me to spend what little cash I had on dining out. We stopped by Zaba and picked up my car, and I followed Kimberly to her apartment. I couldn't believe how helpful this woman was to me, I mean, she was just a fellow worker. I was so going to pay her back every cent and much more as soon as I could sort my finances out. Over dinner, I was really down in the dumps. Not only that, but my two fingers hurt like hell. I had put ice on them as soon as I got to Kimberly's place, but they still hurt. After watching me grimace with pain, Kimberly finally pulled out a bottle of Percocet that she had gotten for a root canal. I took one of those, and after a half hour, the pain faded considerably. Still. I was not good company, they really did a number on me, I lamented. I am totally screwed, glue, and tattooed. I can't even think about getting any revenge against Jacob or Carol right now because it would totally come boomeranging back on me. But someday, I'm going to pay those to back in spades. Mr. Arnold, Kimberly said, in a soft voice, please, call me Michael, I insisted. I'm not your boss anymore, besides, what you've done for me today makes you a very good friend. Kimberly smiled and continued, Michael, my mother cheated on my father and left him for another man. I had to go live with her, and I hated every minute of it. Her lover was an asshole, just like Jacob, he never married my mother, but they lived together for 10 years before he found someone younger to run off with. My father was bitter and tried to get revenge on my mother for years. He wound up in jail several times and finally died a broken man. Don't waste your life trying to get revenge. In the end, my dad told me that he truly regretted letting my mother's betrayal ruin him. He wished he had just moved on and forgotten the bitch. Today, my mother lives alone in an assisted living facility where she struggles with respiratory problems from years of smoking. 
I visit her once a week even though I still don't like her very much. And every week, I have to listen to her lament on what a mistake she made leaving my father. So, please don't waste your life trying to get revenge, I told her that she was probably right. Still, at that moment, I had no intention of letting those backstabbing scum suckers off the hook. The anger was still bubbling just below the surface, and I wanted my pound of flesh. After I helped clean up the dishes, I told Kimberly that I should get going and find a cheap motel. Her response was immediate. No, you're not doing that. You'll spend the night here, I have a spare bedroom, and you're welcome to it. Kimberly, you have been the only ray of sunshine in the pit that is now my life. I can't impose on you anymore. First of all, it isn't an imposition, she insisted. Second, if you sleep here, I can go to work tomorrow and find out what's going on. Again, Kimberly was making a lot more sense than me, so I accepted her invitation. About mid-morning the following day, Kimberly called me to let me know that I had, indeed, been fired. She then told me to fire up her computer and type up a letter instructing HR to send my final check to her address. Surely, the head of human resources wasn't sure whether the company was obligated to pay my vacation time and sick leave, but she felt that should be put in the letter anyway. But the courts have frozen all my money, I pointed out. Shirley told me that the court's order is just for the bank accounts. So, get the letter in as quickly as possible before Jacob or Carol realize what you're doing. I did as Kimberly suggested and got a fax back stating that I would be receiving a check for $4,925.57 in a couple of days. The fax also stated that they had to check state law to determine if the company had to pay vacation time or sick pay. As it turned out, they didn't, still. Getting almost five grand was a big shot in the arm. When Kimberly got home, she told me that Jacob hadn't been in that day, but Carol had been, and she was spitting mad at me for messing up her boyfriend. Somehow, that amused both Kimberly and me. I decided to stay at Kimberly's place until I got my check. During that time, I put together a resume and began actively looking for a job. I discovered very quickly that Jacob and Carol had blackballed me. Since I worked in cybersecurity, no one would take a chance on me with a felony conviction hanging over my head. When my check arrived, I endorsed it over to Kimberly, and she deposited it into her account. I didn't want to take a chance of opening a new account, only to have that one frozen also. Again, when I told Kimberly that I would get out of her hair and rent my own apartment, she was upset. Kimberly pointed out that I probably couldn't even rent a dog house without a checking account. Plus, if they checked my credit rating right now, it would probably show my financial difficulty. Look, please just stay here until you have a new job, she urged me. In the meantime, you can find a lawyer, I finally agreed. The lawyer I retained took me on when I paid him a $2,000 retainer. However, it was money well spent because he immediately petitioned and the courts to allow me access to a reasonable amount of money from our checking and savings accounts. The courts allowed me to spend a sufficient amount to provide a minimum lifestyle. This, of course, included paying my lawyer. I had been at Kimberly's apartment for eight days now and thought it was time to go. So, I found an apartment in her complex and put the necessary deposit on it. That Saturday, Kimberly helped me buy the minimum furnishings from my new abode. I also took her out for the dinner that I promised her. Kimberly wanted to go to the Olive Garden, which I like also. During the meal, I studied her more closely. She had the face of an angel, but the extra 50 pounds she carried detracted from this beauty. And I could tell that Kimberly was very self-conscious about the weight. Then I had an idea that I hoped she wouldn't find insulting. I turned it over in my head, deciding how best to present the suggestion. I just discovered that our complex as a gym I said casually. I'd like to make use of it, but I'd really like to have someone to go with. Would you be interested? You really want to be seen with me? She asked as she moved her hands up and down her sides, indicating her excess weight. Yeah, I would. I said eagerly, unless you'd rather not be seen with a potential felon. My comment had the exact reaction that I wanted. Kimberly really didn't want to go to the gym because she didn't want anyone to see her body. However, Kimberly absolutely didn't want to offend me, so, she agreed. We settled into a schedule of going for times a week at 6 in the morning because there was never anyone there. After the first week, 
Kimberly realized that she didn't have to worry about being embarrassed and started to enjoy the sessions. I continued to look for work, but no one in the security software business was interested in me. At least not until my case was adjudicated. And in talking to my lawyer, I found out that there was a good probability would be found guilty of assault. Yet, he was cagey. He never told me what to say or to lie. Still, he did tell me that if I had flown into a blind rage over my boss and wife's infidelity, that might be a mitigating factor. And if I couldn't remember what actually happened, the court would certainly have to consider that also. On the day of my trial, Kimberly took off from work and came with me. I really appreciated the support. When my lawyer learned that Judge Parker would be the presiding judge, he convinced me to request a bench trial. That's where the judge rather than a jury makes the decision. My attorney explained that it would make the judge happy, and besides, Judge Parker hated cheaters. The prosecutor presented three witnesses to the alleged assault. The prosecutor presented three witnesses to the alleged assault. They told what they had seen and heard. My attorney cross-examined them, getting them all to admit that they hadn't seen the beginning of the fight, nor did they hear me threaten Jacob. They couldn't even state categorically that Mr. Sanders hadn't thrown the first punch. Then Jacob was called to the stand where he told his story. Naturally, Jacob went into great detail about what was called the unprovoked attack. Jacob was emphatic that he hadn't even thrown one punch and then listed the injuries he had sustained. My attorney questioned him about his relationship with my wife. Jacob lied and said they were just friends. When asked about the child my wife was carrying, he told the judge that it was mine as far as he knew. When Jacob got down from the stand, he smirked at me, so he returned to his seat. I was the only witness my attorney called for my defense. And all he did was ask me to describe what had happened the day that led to the alleged assault and what I remembered of the incident. So, I explained how my wife had blindsided me that morning, telling me that she was divorcing me to marry my boss. I was especially devastated when my wife told me the child I thought was mine was, in reality, Jacob's. I explained that she had been the love of my life but she had discarded me like a pair of old shoes. I told the judge that I remembered seeing Jacob by the door and him smirking at me. After that, I lied and said, I didn't remember anything until I was at my desk throwing things into a box. The prosecutor tried to trip me up about my recollections, he kept trying to go over the timeline. The truth was that I was in such a rage that morning that I had no idea about time. And the more he questioned me and tried to get me to commit to specific times and actions, the more it became obvious that I had no idea. Then he asked me if I really thought the court would believe that I, conveniently, didn't remember anything about the assault. I told him that I had a pounding headache on my way to work and saw flashes of light, which actually was true. I reiterated that all I remembered was Jacob smirking at me. Then he asked me if I knew for a fact that the child my wife was carrying was Jacob's. I responded that all I could tell him was what my wife had said. Carol was not in court as no one had bothered to subpoena her. My attorney told me that he felt my wife would be a wild card he didn't want to touch. I assume the prosecutor felt the same. After I stepped down, the judge retired to his chambers to consider his verdict but was back in 10 minutes. It's clear to me, Judge Parker said, that Mr. Arnold was betrayed in a most cowardly and shameful manner. I believe that this shock to his nervous system rendered him badly impaired mentally. I believe Mr. Arnold was temporarily insane, and therefore I find him not guilty. That's outrageous. Jacob roared from his seat, which brought Judge Parker's gavel down hard with a threat at Jacob held in contempt. The sight of Jacob red-faced with anger pleased me. Jacob's victory over me had just taken a small hit. Still, I wanted revenge against him so badly. However, Having just escaped a jail term, I would have to put any thoughts of revenge on hold for the foreseeable future. Besides, I had no idea how to strike back at either of them. Outside the courtroom, Jacob was waiting for me. I toy with the idea of trying to egg him into attacking me. But I wasn't sure how that would turn out, so I simply called a bailiff over. I'm not supposed to be within 500 feet of this man, but he is preventing me from leaving. The bailiff looked at Jacob and told him to move along. Jacob yelled back over his shoulder, this isn't over, I'm going to sue you. That sort of concerned me, so I asked my lawyer, can he sue me? Anyone can sue anyone else, he said with a smile, but his case is weak. But if you really want to cut the legs out from under him, 
admit nothing but offer to pay his medical expenses that weren't covered by insurance. So, that's what I did in a letter addressed to his office. Jacob never responded, and he never filed suit. The following night after my trial, it was now a little over nine weeks since Carol had laid the bombshell on me. While I was still seething with hatred, the winning court had lifted my spirits slightly, so I decided to take Kimberly out for dinner. I also had some exciting news I wanted to share with her. At this point, let me disabuse any readers who think my story is going to follow the usual script. I've read a lot of similar stories about husbands who were betrayed like me. In those stories, it seems that the injured husbands all start up their own businesses. Then the cheated on husband becomes fabulously wealthy and his former wife realizes she made a huge mistake in dumping him. That was never going to happen to me. I am just a worker bee. I'm a good worker bee, but just a worker bee. Kimberly and I had agreed to meet at a small Italian restaurant. She had to work a little later that night because all was not well in my forward department. It wasn't anything serious, they were simply adjusting to my not being there. Anyway, when she came in, she looked wonderful. Kimberly was still heavy, but it was obvious that she had lost weight, and the dress she wore was very flattering. I stood up and kissed her on the cheek. Wow, you look wonderful. You've lost weight, haven't you? Kimberly beamed. Yes, I've lost 16 pounds. I'm sorry I didn't notice before now, but you wear those oversized sweatshirts and sweatpants. Anyway, like I said, you look wonderful. The restaurant was small and intimate. It was exactly the kind of place that couples would choose for a date. But I didn't think of this as a date. It was just a meeting between two close friends. I asked you to have dinner with me tonight because I wanted to celebrate winning in court. And I have some news. I found a job. That's wonderful. Kimberly beamed. Who are you going to work for? Sable Security out of Jacksonville, Florida. I responded. I didn't know they had an office here. Kimberly said with concern. They don't. I'm going to have to relocate to Jacksonville. I was totally surprised when the light went out in Kimberly's eyes and tears began to roll down her cheeks. I thought you'd be happy for me, I said, confused. I am happy that you found a job, Kimberly said, as the tears continued to flow, but you're going to be 600 miles away. Kimberly, do you remember when you told me not to let my wife's betrayal consume me with hatred? She nodded dot dot. I now understand that the only way I can do that is to put some distance between Carol and me and let time do the rest. I understand, Kimberly said, as she dabbed her eyes. It's just that I'm going to miss you. I have really enjoyed having a friend. Hey, I'm only a phone call away, I said, trying to cheer her with no success. I was truly surprised by Kimberly's reaction. Then it struck me that she probably didn't have many friends, so I offered another suggestion. You could come down and visit if you like. I don't know what Jacksonville has to offer, but I'll find out. You'd really like me to come to visit. She questioned, of course, I said quickly. Remember, I'm not going to have any friends down there either. When are you leaving? Kimberly finally asked. I don't start for another 45 days, but I've got a lot to get done before then. I've got to find some place to live, open a new checking account in a bank there. I also have to go for a polygraph test, get fingerprinted, and take a drug test. I figure it's going to take at least two trips down there to get it all done. The mood lightened somewhat after that, but I noticed that Kimberly didn't eat very much. I figured she was still a little upset. In fact, the closer it got to the time I was supposed to leave, I found Kimberly getting a little sadder each day. It seemed that she was hoping for something more between us. I have to confess that this confused me because I felt Kimberly could do so much better than me. I spent my last night before heading to my new job in Kimberly's apartment. She made a delicious dinner topped off with a chocolate cake with the message, I'll miss you on top. After I helped her clean up, we watched television until it was time for bed. I gave her a peck on her lips before heading into the guest room. Sometime during the night, I felt the bed shift slightly and a body slid in next to me. I was still half asleep when I realized it was Kimberly. Kimberly, I don't have any rubbers with me, I tried to explain. It's not my fertile time, she said in a hushed voice. Please, make love to me. After breakfast, I checked my car one last time to make sure I had everything. Then I turned to Kimberly and kissed her, 
she responded with perhaps the most passionate kiss I'd ever received. Then, suddenly, it was time for me to go. As my car pulled away, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw Kimberly sit down on the curb. She buried her head in her hands and sobbed. I desperately didn't want to leave her, but I knew this was for the best. I was still in love with Carol, and therefore, I was damaged goats. It was somewhat funny, though, because I no longer thought about revenge. I just had a profound sadness deep in my heart. Jacksonville was an exciting city, but I didn't get to see much of it. I jumped into my new job with both feet. I work long hours, not just to get caught up, but because it helped me forget about Carol, I kept in touch with Kimberly, and she always seemed so thrilled to hear from me and so sad when our phone call would end. It was from her that I heard the news that I dreaded. Carol and Jacob were married about a month after the divorce was final. I also learned that Carol had a baby girl, for whatever reason, that news didn't bother me as much. Maybe I was beginning to get over the her and humiliation. It was true that I seldom had any sleepless nights anymore. I also rarely woke up in the morning depressed that Carol wasn't in bed beside me. Kimberly came down and spent for days with me in March. Since we hadn't seen each other for some time, we were unsure about our relationship. We sort of danced around the issue of sex and didn't sleep together until the last two nights. It was almost as intense as that first time. Only this time, I had rubbers on hand. Maybe for dozen was a bit overly optimistic, but I did use six of them over those two nights. About a year after that, I was told that I could hire an administrative assistant for my team. Sable's security was considerably larger than my old company. Whereas Zaba had one team that worked on cybersecurity issues, we had six. And in that year, I had advanced from just being part of one team to heading it. As the decision was mine as to who to hire, I immediately called Kimberly. I had barely explained the job to her when she said that she wanted it. When I picked Kimberly up at the airport, she took my breath away, as I had predicted, she was gorgeous. I saw men's head snap around as she came out of the passenger area, but all she wanted to do was to get to me. She threw herself into my arms and kissed me with a passion that buckled my knees. The plan was for Kimberly to stay with me until she found an apartment of her own. I figured that would only take about a week, but the search stretched out week after week. Each apartment she looked at had something wrong with it. I wasn't complaining because Kimberly and I were sharing the same bed. It's funny that over the year and a half that I'd been in Jacksonville, I had continued to think about Carol less and less. And when Kimberly arrived, I stopped thinking about her at all. Still, I knew that Kimberly would eventually move out, and I was dreading that day. After five weeks, I asked Kimberly about her apartment situation, and she started to cry. I was totally dumbfounded, I knew that I had made her cry, but for the life of me, I didn't know why. I'm sorry, I apologized, did I say something wrong? Do you want me to leave? Kimberly asked timidly. Hell, no. I said forcefully, I'd love for you to stay permanently, but I know that one day you're going to want to leave. I just want some time to prepare. I ask you to marry me, but you are way too good for me. No, I'm not. Kimberly protested, I've loved you almost from the day I started working at Zaba. I'd marry you in a heartbeat. That changed everything for us. We went shopping for a ring that day and began planning our wedding. Even though I was terrified that Kimberly would eventually dump me for someone else, I was so in love with her that I had to take the chance. Six months later, Kimberly and I were married. A year after that, Kimberly gave birth to a little bow we call Mikey. Junior 18 months after that, we had a little girl named Charlotte. I had now risen in Sable to where I supervised all eight cybersecurity teams. Yes, we had added to more. Kimberly, on the other hand, had opted to be a stay-at-home mom. It was close to Christmas, three years later when I was called into a meeting. It was at this meeting that I learned that Sable was planning to acquire Zaba security software. I was to be part of a team that would conduct the due diligence before the acquisition could be finalized. During the years that Kimberly and I had been married, Kimberly's mother had died, but my parents retired. They had moved to Jacksonville to be nearer to the grandchildren and me. With them as babysitters, I made plans to use the week-long getaway as a mini vacation. I would also use Kimberly's skills as an administrative assistant to help me do my investigation. That way, I could take Kimberly to work with me every day, 
where she could see some of the people she had worked with, and we'd be able to slip away for long lunches together. As the week in Nashville progressed, I learned for things. First, I learned that this facility was the only location where Zabat did its cybersecurity work. Second, Jacob had been installed as the chief operating officer, and Carol was a senior project manager. Third, that despite my animosity toward Jacob, I found that he ran a tight shit. I found that his entire operation, from my standpoint, was first rate. And the last thing I learned was the Zaba was having their Christmas party the Friday night, and I was expected to go. Outside of the first introductions of our team to Jacob, I had no contact with him. Also, I never saw Carol during the entire week. However, that changed at the Christmas party. Zaba had rented a ballroom in the Hilton Doubletree in downtown Nashville. It was festively decorated with tables ringing the outside of the dance floor, and a five-member band had set up in one of the corners. They quietly played Christmas carols, soft background music, and occasionally mixed in oldies. There was to be dancing after the dinner and speeches. Also, there was an open bar to everyone's delight. And it was gaining increased attention as more and more people arrive. Jacob, Carol, and some of the senior officers from Zaba made a point of greeting the Sable team. I had not been looking forward to this. I didn't know how I would react to having to face Jacob and Carol together. However, my fears were for nothing. Jacob, as I already knew, looked about the same. And Carol, while looking a tad older, still looked good. Strangely, I felt nothing when they came to greet us. Mike, I'm glad you could join us tonight, Jacob said nervously. I hope our past differences won't interfere with the acquisition. Not from me, I assured him, that's ancient history. And who is this vision of loveliness? Jacob smiled widely as he took Kimberly's hand. This is my lovely wife, Kimberly, I said as I kissed her cheek. Jacob's smile evaporated as he looked at Kimberly and then me. Kimberly smirked at Jacob, don't you remember me, Jacob? I was Michael's administrative assistant when he worked for Zaba, but I traded up to become Michael's wife. It was a huge promotion for me. Jacob's eyes narrowed further, but he tried to put the smile back on. However, it didn't seem genuine, of course, it's been so long. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. Jacob moved on, but his eyes continued to wander back to Kimberly and me. Carol then slid up next to me. Dot dot. Michael, you're looking really good she said as she took my hand. And your wife is gorgeous, I didn't know you had gotten married. We'll be married seven years in March, Kimberly said with a smile as she hugged my arm. Both you and Jacob are looking well, I reply, and then asked, how is your daughter doing? Carol cringed at first but then smiled, she's doing great. Tammy is in the second grade, and her brother, Jacob, Jr., is in kindergarten. Do you guys have any children, too? Kimberly answered. Mickey, Jr., is in kindergarten, and Charlotte is still at home with me. They're both doing well, thank you for asking. Carol moved on after that, and shortly after that, Kimberly and I drifted away to find our table. The meal was excellent, and the speeches were, thankfully, short. The CEO of Sable simply assured everyone that nobody's job was in jeopardy for at least the next year and that he looked forward to the merger. When the dinner was done, the music started in earnest, and Kimberly and I took several spins around the floor. I think the young kids of today have really missed the mark when it comes to dancing. Slow dancing with someone you love is such an intimate thing, it can connect to people almost as much as having sex. Sometime during the evening, I felt a tap on my shoulder. When I turned, I found Carol standing there. Kimberly turned to see what I was looking at, and her eyes narrowed when she realized it was my ex-wife. Carol smiled sweetly at Kimberly, could I borrow your husband for a dance? Kimberly looked at me and then smiled at Carol, just as long as you remember where to bring him back to. I guided Carol out onto the dance floor, and we danced in silence for about a minute. Michael, I just want to apologize to you for what Jacob and I did to you back then, she said with true remorse in her voice. You didn't deserve any of it, but when I discovered that I was pregnant with Jacob's child, I knew we were through. I decided to make our break quick and simple. I never even considered how much it would hurt you. I shouldn't have allowed Jacob to talk me into the scorched earth policy we used. That was totally uncalled for. I chuckled a little. As people said, 
It's either water under the bridge or water over the dam. It doesn't matter now, we've all moved on. Besides, I sort of did deserve some of it. I did beat the crap out of Jacob, apparently. I didn't damage his testicles too badly because you've had a second kid. Carol giggled at that. We danced for a bit in silence, and I decided to bury the hatchet between us once and for all. Look, Carol, I began hesitantly. I admit I was very bitter when you left me for Jacob. It did take many months to accept losing you. But now we're both happily married with kids. I've come to believe that this was what was meant to happen. Carol chalked out a harsh laugh, and when I looked at her face, a tear was running down her cheek. Did I say something wrong? Carol just shook her head. No, Michael, you didn't say anything wrong. It's just that it isn't what you think. On the surface, everyone thinks we're the perfect couple. And for the first year, I would have agreed with them. But Jacob is just a charming manipulator. He uses people and then discards them. I know that he's cheated on me many times, but he isn't as smart as he thinks he is. Every time I find out he's cheated on me, I cheat on him. My mouth dropped open, and Carol noticed. She chuckled. It's a hell of a way to live. I know, she said subtly. I should have left Jacob when I found out what he was really like, but I was too ashamed and too proud. Michael, I am pleased that you found happiness, but I will always regret that I tossed you away. You and my children are the best things that ever happened to me. We continued to talk until the song ended. Then Carol accompanied me back to my table and thanked Kimberly for letting her borrow me. As Kimberly and I were dancing our last dance of the night, it struck me that her advice all those years ago had been spot on. If I had refused to move on from Carol, it might very well have consumed me. I guess it's true what they say. When God closes a door, he opens another one. When I lost Carol I was totally devastated, but then God let me find Kimberly. And I can't even imagine a life without her. So, what did you and Carol talk about? Kimberly finally asked. Is she trying to get you back? I laughed and kissed her. Like she has any chance of doing that. Good. Kimberly said as she put her head on my shoulder. Just remember that I'm a jealous one man sort of woman. I'll cut your you know what off if you ever try to leave me. I only bring it up because I heard that their marriage isn't all sunshine and rainbows. Carol told me the same. I agree but I think they'll stay together for the children. After the kids are grown, I wouldn't put any baits on that marriage surviving. What a sad way to live your life. Anyway, Carol did tell me something that I found amusing. I know that she was not at all amused by it, and I'm pretty sure that Jacob isn't going to find it amusing when they get home tonight. What's that? Carol was standing behind her husband, and he didn't realize she was there. Jacob was staring at you when he said, that damn Michael won again. Subscribe to the channel if you liked the video and don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section below. Thank you.